Now, as we examine the scripture, we see that way back in the Garden of Eden, uh, God defined humanity as perfect and righteous. Uh, and then humanity allowed sin to come along and to redefine us in a negative way. Sin corrupts who we are and separates us from God. But because God desperately loves us, he makes a way for us to be redefined all over again, for us to be restored back to the way it was in the Garden of Eden, where we are wiped clean and declared to be righteous, given access to God. And it is awesome. We are declared righteous, and nothing we do can make us unrighteous. Nothing we do can negate our righteous standing in God's sight. Man, some people I know look at me when they, they hear me say those types of things and, and they say, well, Kenny, isn't, uh, uh, aren't you giving people a license to sin? I mean, if you can do whatever you want and, and it doesn't affect your righteousness, if you can behave however you want and it doesn't affect your standing with God, aren't you giving people a license to sin? Haven't you made the gospel too easy? To that, I respond in this way. It wasn't Kenny that made the gospel too easy. The credit for that, or the blame, you might think, belongs to one man. His name is Jesus. He was the one that said, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. If you're, if you're not familiar with uh, this, the imagery of the scriptures, the, Jesus there is, is using a common first century symbol, the yoke. Uh, the yoke was a farming tool that was often used to take two different animals, typically uh, two oxen, and the yoke was a, a round wooden structure that would go around their necks and hold them together to, to force them to be able to work together. And so the, the metaphor for the yoke is basically referring to how we believe that we are tied or bound to God. Or in other words, to say my yoke is to say how I believe I must act or what I must do in order for me to be bound to God. Well, in the first century, there was a group of Jewish leaders that the Pharisees, they had a yoke that was incredibly burdensome and emotionally taxing. And Jesus shows up on the scene and he goes, guys, I have a yoke. I have a way that you can be bound to God, and it's really, really easy. He is the one that makes a way for us to come to God. It is by His grace. In fact, biblical grace is never burdensome grace. If the form of grace you're preaching is burdensome, then it's not biblical grace. I will admit that grace does have sort of a, a sense of scandal about it. There's this sense of scandal that comes along with the freedom we have in Christ. You could almost call it a scandalous form of freedom. Some people say, it's just too good to be true. And I would tell you, it's not too good to be true. Because the God that promises it, he is good and he is true. Grace does have about it a sense of of scandal, but it is very real and it is offered to you. In fact, the Apostle Paul talks about this in the book of Romans, chapter 5. He says that wherever sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. That means wherever there's a lot of sin, God is pouring out a lot of grace. The more abundance of God's love and mercy and forgiveness is bestowed upon you. Why? Because God wants to make sure that all of your sin is covered. Why does he do that? Because he loves you. It's unfathomable to me that the God of the universe, the creator and sustainer of everything, would look at me and say, I'm going to bestow an abundance of grace so that all your sin will be forgiven. God loves us and he's always willing to forgive. Just take Peter, for example. Peter was Jesus' key protege. For more than three years, he walked with Jesus. He was coached by Jesus, mentored by Jesus. He did ministry with Jesus. He was the leader of the 12 disciples. And he was the guy who would inherit uh, the, the, the leadership, the mantle, to take the church into, the, into the, the rest of the first century. And he blew it big time. He denied Jesus. On the night where Jesus needed friendship and loyalty the most, Peter said, I never even met that guy. What a disgrace Peter was in that moment. How does Jesus respond? Is he angry? 
Is he mad at him? Is, does he strip him of the right to be an apostle? Does he tell him, no, you've got you to earn it back? No. Just a few days after Peter sins and blows it big time, Peter and Jesus have a conversation on a beach where Jesus forgives Peter and invites him to have friendship with him again. Peter feels guilty. Like, I can't do it, Lord. And Jesus is the one that makes it clear. Peter, it's as if you never did it. It's been wiped clean. You are forgiven. And he gives Peter a command to go feed my sheep. He's telling Peter, go be a pastor, a leader, a preacher, a teacher. Lead others to me. And the invitation is the same for us today. Even when we blow it big, Jesus says, go feed my sheep. I've forgiven you. You're the only one that keeps bringing up the sin. I have forgiven it. In fact, the Bible tells us, uh, that the prophet, the prophet Micah tells us that God takes our sin and he throws it into the sea of forgetfulness, never to be brought back again. God is saying he's forgotten it. Not because he's some absent-minded professor who can't seem to remember. No, no, because he has chosen to wipe the record clean. Why do you keep bringing your sin back up to him? Why do you continue to hold on to the guilt? When Jesus says, I forgive you and I love you. There's a great quote from one of my favorite authors, an author by the name of Philip Yancey. He has a, a great, well-known book called What's So Amazing About Grace? And I just want to read you a quote uh, from that book when he's talking about Grace, And he's answering the question of when people questioning him about the gospel being too easy or, or him giving people a license to sin. He says these words. I have portrayed God as a lovesick father eager to forgive and grace as a force potent enough to break the chains that bind us and merciful enough to overcome differences between us. Depicting grace in such sweeping terms makes people nervous. And I concede that I have skated to the very edge of danger. I have done so because I believe the New Testament does too. Grace has about it a scent of scandal. So many people are nervous when you start talking about grace. Because it's just scandalous. It just doesn't feel right that God would forgive me no matter what. And, and the New Testament does indeed depict God as a lovesick father, eager to forgive, longing to show his mercy. That's the God that we serve. That's the God that you believe in. The God who has redefined you all over again and declared you to be righteous. Some people ask me, then, then why do I live for God? Why should I obey the scripture and actually get rid of sin if, if God's going to forgive me no matter what? What's the point of obedience? I'm going to answer that question very clearly. Before we do that, I want to kind of unpack another biblical concept that I think will help us understand uh, biblical grace a little more. Sometimes people talk about this concept of repentance, or people will ask me, well, what does it mean to repent? The Bible does clearly tell us that we ought to repent. A part of coming to God and being forgiven is this thing called repentance. The word repentance, biblically, simply refers to a changing of our mind. It's the Greek word metanoia. Let me give you a great example. I don't know about you, one of my favorite foods is buffalo wings. I am a huge fan of buffalo wings. I used to go to Applebee's quite a bit to have their buffalo wings. In my mind, they were the best buffalo wings that you could ever get anywhere. And then one day, I discovered a new restaurant, a place called Buffalo Wild Wings, or more affectionately known as B-dubs. Now, when I discovered B-dubs, I felt like I was cheating on Applebee's, but quite frankly, they just have better wings, better options, better food. My mind was changed. I had a metanoia experience. I ate their buffalo wings. I used to think Applebee's was the best. But now I am of the opinion that B-Dubs is the best. And so now, whenever I want to go eat buffalo wings, I, I don't go to Applebee's. I, I go to, I go to B-Dubs. I've had a changing of my mind. And with that, my actions will follow. You see, some people will say repentance is changing your action or changing your ways. It's actually not true. Repentance is a changing of your mind. And when you do change your mind, there would be an expectation 
that you change your actions. Your actions will always fall in line with your mind, your opinions, and your perspectives. Okay, so now maybe using an illustration from my favorite food, uh, buffalo wings, maybe isn't uh, exactly the best illustration for biblical repentance. Let me use a different story. A uh, true story about a friend of mine, we'll call him Nelson. He was uh, dating a girl named Kim, and he was uh, really in love with Kim, just so into her, and really uh, great, you know, constantly talked about her and all the great things about her. Um, Kim, at some point in the relationship, just felt like she didn't want to move on, so she broke it off, and Nelson was heartbroken. The odd thing, though, is that Nelson and Kim kept hanging out quite a bit. Even after they broke up, they still got to eat together and hang out. Uh, they were still physically intimate and, and on a regular basis, and so we, as friends of Nelson, thought it was very odd. Um, then at some point, uh, our friend Nelson meets a girl uh, named Abby, and um, he seems to really fall in love with Abby and begins to spend less time with Kim and more with Abby. And eventually he's official with Abby and that relationship seems to be going well. But every now and then he'd still spend time with Kim. Uh, and against our advice, he, he would do things with her that we thought was odd and eventually led to an inappropriate relationship. And when Abby found out, she was obviously uh, angry and, and broke it off. The reality is those of us who know Nelson know that he was really in love with Kim all along. And he never really stopped having feelings for her. Some people, uh, they're in love with the world. They're in love with sin. and They have that sort of relationship with sin. and They do whatever they want. And then they come to faith in Christ. And, and they say, oh, I love God. And I no longer love. And loving God is way better than loving sin. There, there even seems to be a genuine lifestyle change over a period of time. But eventually, uh, true colors always come to the surface. We see people who made what appear to be genuine professions of faith at some point, uh, maybe going back to their old sin and not really loving God. And I think, I think this shows us what real repentance is really all about. You see, my friend Nelson, he never really changed his mind about Kim. He, he never had a repentance or a metanoia experience with her. He still thought she was pretty great. Now, he did have some level of affection for Abby, and he definitely cared for her to some extent, but he is... His real opinion was that Kim was, was the best. And many people are the same with God. They really love their own way of doing things. They love being in control of their own lives. They love living their life however they want. And they may have some affinity for God, or they may have a like of God in some way. They may like the things of God oh, to some extent, but they never really changed their mind. They still don't believe that God is the very best. In essence, they're not taking God at his word. God has declared he is the very best. And if you don't believe that, then you're not a real believer in God. And you have not been redefined. If you are not a true believer of God, if you have not truly taken him at his word and put all your confidence in him, then you've not been redefined. You've not been declared righteous. You are still separated from God. And the reality is that while our behavior does not affect our belief, our belief will always affect our behaviors. So it goes back to the original question. Why should I live for God if I know God's going to forgive me no matter what? If I am righteous no matter what, why should I obey him? Well, that's really quite simple. Because you love him. If I love him, I'm going to live for him. A little bit earlier, I I quoted the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 5 where he says, where, wherever sin abounds, then grace abounds. Well, in the very next breath, the Apostle Paul poses this question. Should we just keep on sinning so that grace may abound? Should we just keep on doing the wrong things because we know God's going to pour out his loving grace? He responds in a very forceful manner. By no means. God forbid. He's saying, are you crazy? Of course not. We know God will forgive us no matter what. Does that mean we should just go on sinning? No. Why? Because we love God. In addition to that, sin can ruin our lives. And if you used to be mastered by sin, if sin was the ruler of your life, you know the devastation and the pain of that. And we all know that. We all know the pain and destruction that bad choices and sin brings. If God has freed you from that and forgiven you from that, why would you want to go back to that? Why would you want to continue to bring destruction upon yourself? 
See, God has forgiven us. We never have to suffer the eternal consequences of sin. But in this life, as we make bad and stupid choices, we end up bringing pain upon ourselves and upon those around us that we love. Grace is real and awesome and abounding and has about it a a scent of scandal. It's a scandalous freedom that God has given us. And unless you believe that and embrace it, chances are you'll never be able to actually live obediently. You see, if you feel like you have to serve God, you have pressure and guilt, this weight, this burden. Remember, Jesus says, my burden is light. You know, if I don't have to serve God if I don't want to, then when I do choose to serve him, I'm excited to do it. And when I fail, I never have to feel guilty. I can be excited when I do it and never have to be ashamed when I don't. That is the scandalous freedom that Jesus has given to us. And when we embrace this, when we know that God will love us no matter what, and actually give us the power to go live righteously. Another one of my greatest, uh, one of my most favorite authors is a guy by the name of Steve Brown. He's a pastor in Florida. And uh, he says it best this way, and I'll close with this. He says, the only people who ever get any better are the ones that know that if they never get any better, God will still love them anyway. Even if you never get any better, God will still love you anyway. That's his grace and his freedom.